according to Daily Variety. It's how they describe Larry Elder. He's a best-selling author, radio and TV talk show host on my favorite uh, radio station, KRLA 870. He sizzles on the airwaves with his thoughtful insight on the day's most provocative issues to the delight, to the consternation, and entertainment of his listeners. He's a blend of fiscal conservative and social liberal with attitude which has made him one of the most in-demand radio personalities and cable news pundits in the country. He hosted the longest running afternoon drive time radio show in Los Angeles and in 2016, his radio show became a nationally syndicated daily talk show. Known to his listeners as the Sage from South Central, please welcome my friend, Mr. Larry Elder. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. I was listening to, uh, to Emmy, and I kind of expected him to tee off on the media and accuse them of being fair and uh, even as it comes to Israel. Instead, he said a lot of things that I, that I agree with. I kind of feel like David Duke when um, David Duke and Jesse Jackson and Benjamin Netanyahu were walking down the beach. <laughs> they saw a magic lantern. They picked it up. They rubbed it. Jeannie comes out. Gentlemen, one wish, what would you like? Al Sharpton said, I'd like every black man, every black woman, every black child to leave this racist country and return to our ancestral homeland, the great continent of Africa. Benjamin Netanyahu said, I'd like to see every Jew leave America and return to their ancestral homeland, the great state of Israel. David Duke went, I'll have a small Coke. I thought the evidence for the proposition that the media are biased, in particular against Israel, and biased in general against conservatives, was overwhelming. I haven't seen this kind of evidence of guilt since the O.J. Simpson case, where <laughs> O.J. Simpson butchered Ron and Nicole and did everything but leave his business card and blame it on the racist LAPD. <laughs> First of all, just, just look at what they say themselves. I once interviewed Walter Cronkite called the most trusted man in America. And the interview was going along fine. I asked him whether or not the media were liberal. He said, well, if you mean by liberal open-minded, yes. And I said, well, do you think that you were engaging as a journalist or as a commentator when, in 1968, after the Tet Offensive, you publicly said, we're losing this war? And Lyndon Johnson said, if we've lost Walter, we've lost the war. Do you think that you were operating as a objective journalist when you made that commentary? He ended the interview and essentially hung up on me. Peter Jennings, the longtime anchor at ABC News, once said that the media are liberal. Andy Rooney, the longtime commentator on CBS who worked with Dan Rather for decades, publicly said that Dan Rather was transparently liberal and he should do a better job of it. The former executive editor of the New York Times said, of course we have a liberal progressive philosophy that more or less believes the kinds of things that left-wing people do. This is what our paper is, this is what we do. A rare, candid admission of bias. The current executive editor of the New York Times is a man named Dean Baquet. The New York Times recently hired a new columnist named Brett Stevens who used to write for the Wall Street Journal. His first column had to do with his skepticism about climate change. Because of that first column, the New York Times got a whole bunch of phone calls from people canceling their subscriptions and Dan Baquette had to defend the decision to hire this man. And he said, I've come to the conclusion, quote, as a general rule, the left does not want to hear thoughtful disagreement End of quote. Washington Post was honest enough to do a analysis of their campaign coverage, 2008 Barack Obama versus John McCain. The ombudsperson for the Washington Post, Deborah Howell, wrote two pieces. And she said, on the front page of our newspaper, 
there were more pictures of Barack Obama than John McCain, more flattering pictures of Barack Obama than John McCain, more articles about, John, uh, about Barack Obama than John McCain. And it so incensed one of the editors of the Washington Post, he said, we're not garment cutters here. We're putting out a paper that people want to buy. And Barack Obama is a far more interesting person than John McCain. Truth in advertising. You're admitting that you're putting out a product in order to make a buck. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a capitalist. But please, don't give me this all the news that's fit to print. Don't give me this fair and balanced. You're not. These are admissions that they've made. And then, of course, there are the data. A number of books have documented left-wing bias uh, in the media against, you name the issue, whether it's race-based preferences, they're down with it. Whether it's the climate change alarmism, they're down with it. Whether it's the assertion that Israel is the aggressor, they're down with that. You name the left-wing issue, and that's what they believe. There is a wonderful book called Left Turn, written by a friend of mine named Tim Groseclose, who is a professor of politics and of economics at George Mason University, used to, write, used to work for UCLA, which is where he wrote the book. He analyzed the top 20 sources of news. Of the top 20 sources, 18 were to the left. Only two were to the right, and that was the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal and the Fox Evening News with Brett Stevens. Outside of that, ABC, NBC, CBS, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post, you name it, they're left wing. And 80 to 90% of people get their primary news source from one of those left wing sources. So if you are watching CNN, if you are reading the LA Times, if you're reading the, the um, Chicago Tribune, if you're watching MSNBC, you are ill-informed. And that ignorance can take all sorts of bizarre turns. When I came home from school once, a very close friend of mine had changed his name to Abdul. He changed his name because he wanted to renounce the racist name he had before and the racist religion of Christianity. I informed him that Arab slavers took more blacks out of Africa and took them to South Africa and to the Middle East than did European slavers. They did it hundreds of years earlier and continued doing it well after the Europeans stopped. He was unaware of that. I told him that Israel airlifted 16,000 Jews out of Ethiopia in the mid-80s and the early 90s. He was unaware of that. I told him that the man who helped to found the Tuskegee Institute, Mr. Rosenwald, a Jew, had went on to help Booker T. Washington found some 5,000 schools, mostly in the South. He was unaware of that. Have you seen the movie Mississippi Burning? He said, yes. Are you aware that of the three young men who died, Messrs. Cheney and Schwerner and Goodman, two of the three were Jewish? Unaware. Are you aware that of the non-blacks who went down the South in the 60s to register people to vote, 75% of them were Jewish? Unaware of that. I have a friend who one time was talking about how dominant she thought the Jews were. And I said, what percentage of the world do you believe is Jewish? She said, no idea. Ballpark it. No idea. Give me a guess. <laughs> she said, 20, 25%. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? She said, no, about 20, 20. Are you, I said, you think one in four persons on the face of the earth is Jewish? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, how about two-tenths of one percent? She said, oh my goodness, two-tenths? I said, you didn't listen. Two-tenths of one percent. Seven billion people in the world, 14 million Jews, do the math. Two-tenths of one percent. She said she had no idea. How can you have no idea? Too much CNN, too little Larry Elder. One of the reasons for the skewed perspective is because the media never puts things in context. Israel is a tiny country. I visited Israel when I was 21 years old. I had my birthday in Israel. That's kind of spiritual. Tiny country. It is 1 50th the size of America. So 
when a terrorist kills four Israelis. That's how it's reported. It's never translated to terms we can understand. Las Vegas, we lost over 50 people. In Orlando, we lost over 30 people. Four people multiplied times 50 is 200. For us to get some sort of perspective, it's as if you picked up the newspaper and read that 200 Americans had been blown up in a terror attack. Do you think maybe there'd have been some conversation about that? I think so. But you pick up the newspaper, two Jews were killed, ah. If you pick up the newspaper and you read that 100 Americans were killed, oh my goodness, what happened? Total and complete lack of perspective, and that's on the media. I, uh, <laughs> I am told not to speak too long, we're gonna have uh, Q&A, but I like to, uh, just the, the ignorance is one of the reasons why we have the degree of anti-Semitism that we have in this country. I gave a speech before the ADL once, and before I spoke, they went over the results of a poll they commissioned and said, good news, anti-Semitism in America is at an all-time low, 12%. And I said, well, don't expect that number to go down much further. 10% believe that Elvis is still alive, and 8% of Americans believe that if you send him a letter, he will get it. I'm not making this up. 36%, however, of blacks are perceived to be anti-Semitic. And it is largely because of the media, because of people like Jesse Jackson, who once referred to New York as Jaime and Jews as Jaime Town, and Al Sharpton, who once was involved in the Crown Heights riots, denied his, in, his involvement, a tape surfaced showing him challenging the Jews to pin their yarmulkes and come over to my house and get it on. And you have Minister Farrakhan, of course, who's one of the leading anti-Semites in this country, all of whom have had a perverse effect on how blacks perceive what's going on uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I um, want to end by saying, I believe it was right in this ballroom when I was asked to participate in an affair honoring the state of Israel. Frank McCourt, the then owner of the Dodgers, and his wife were big contributors to Israel. I was invited. I was sitting in the back. At my table was a publicist named Warren Cowan, probably the greatest publicist ever. And I heard that Sandy Koufax was sitting at the table in the front. I've always admired Sandy Koufax, my hero when I was growing up. And I said to Warren, is there any way you could maybe go down there and perhaps have me get a chance to meet Sandy? I'll be right back. He walks down, he comes back about five minutes later, follow me. We walk down the hall, Sandy Koufax stands up, tuxedo on, black tie affair, he looked magnificent. I said, Sandy, I am such a fan. You know, uh, he told you that I'm a talk show host, but what I always wanted to be was a writer, and the first thing I ever wrote was about you and it got published, and I was in the sixth grade uh, manual. He goes, really? I said, yeah, I wrote a poem about you. Let me give you the first stanza. It was, Koufax is on the mound, the game has just begun, he gets a sign from the catcher, and swish, strike one. And Sandy leaned over and said, don't quit your day job. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. May God bless you. May God continue to bless the great state of Israel. Just waiting for Hemi. There he is. All right. 